has come to save, conquer death and the grave. We know we are free, we know we are free. Our lives have been redeemed, death bows before the king, the one who saves, rescues from the grave. We know, we know our God, our hope. There is no one who is greater than our God, our King, who sent his Son to save us. He brought liberty, death no longer has a hold. Our chains have been released, we are free, oh.
home All that was lost has found its place in you You lift our weary head You make us strong instead You took these racks and made us This will be our anthem song Jesus, we love you Oh, how we love you You are the one in our hearts Our hearts adore Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one in our hearts, our hearts adore. Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the of Jesus, our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus, we love you, oh how we love you. You are the one in our hearts, our hearts adore. Oh, Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one in our hearts, our hearts adore. So anybody watching online, I want you to know we love you. We want to see your spiritual health um, uh, growing. If we can pray for you, please let us know if there's anything else we can do for you. Uh, just let us know we want to help in any way we can. And if you are new or newish <clears throat> here at Mountainside, we also have um, connect cards somewhere. I think they're in the front. We would love to connect with you as well. Uh, fill one out if you're new, newish. If you, you should be getting um, information from the church online. If you're not getting updates from us, we messed your information up. Sorry. Uh, fill one of our Connect cards up. Are they, where are they? Uh, like where the coffee and donuts are. Coffee and donuts, Connect card, fill it out. And there's like clean pens back there, right? COVID-free pens. Fill one out with a COVID-free pen, and we would love to get you, make sure that we're emailing you and, and updating you. Uh, three quick announcements. One, DARE uh, prayer is this Thursday at Bride's House. 
Second, you'll notice in December, we're doing an adult's night out and it's a movie night. So we are renting, uh, a, not the theater, but the screen. So Mountainside's gonna rent a screen <clears throat> and then we're going to, well, details coming, right? Details coming. So adult's night out coming, we're renting a movie theater. And then, um, is there anything else, Dave, that I'm forgetting coming up? No? So uh, Christmas season's coming. We'll get, let you know more information about the Christmas service that's coming up as well. So I want to say this to encourage uh, each and every one of you. I am having like wonderful meetings with people from our church, people outside of our church, and I am being encouraged that God is clearly using COVID for all the garbage that is going on. God is using COVID to change people's lives. He really is. For those people who are willing to be changed. Um, oftentimes in my life, what God has done is he's used copious amounts of pain and struggling to strip things away from me and then present himself to me and say, here I am, you need me. And so I just wanted to say, God is really working and he's working in, in you. And um, just know that part of this stripping process can also be a wonderful growth process as well. So um, let me pray before we get started on our second key point in following Jesus tonight. Father God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for each and every person who's here. And uh, thank you for our audience online. Father, we know that um, the COVID uh, cases are uh, growing right now in Washoe County around the America as well. And we want to pray for your safety. Uh, we want to pray for your wisdom in knowing what to deal with all of this. Um, thank you for tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so last week we started our five-part series on following Jesus. Really it's uh, information taken from the book of Matthew and then my study of the New Testament. And what I was asking myself was, if you're a Christian or you're a new Christian or an old Christian, what are, some, what are five things that I could give you if you did these five things, you would be moving forward in your Christian life and you would really begin to shut doors that Satan wants to open into your mind and to your heart. And so last week uh, we gave uh, point number one, which was I will listen to the Holy Spirit as I read my Bible and pray. Um, I was wondering, um, I actually want us to do something about this. So if you're listening online, if you're here, I actually had hoped, I, I know this is, it's like a parental lecture. Like you lecture your kids and you're like, oh, on it, dad. Three weeks later, you check in. They're like, no, I was not on that at all. Uh, what I was hoping was that we would actually pick up our Bibles more and read more this week. And so for me, I found a time, I've been in the word more. Um, I would ask that you would, you would do that. It is critically important that you begin to read your Bible, to pray, and to begin to listen to the Holy Spirit in your life. Critically important. If you were just to take the amount of time, I'm guessing, that you are receiving data from this world and then uh, compare it to how much you're receiving from God and His Word, I'm thinking just because of the world we live in, uh, this stuff from the world is going to be more. And so we really need to be in God's word. Let me also say, um, Alice and I just ordered uh, this uh, DVD, uh, the first, the first um, season is out. They're filming the second season. It's eight episodes. It's called The Chosen. I would really encourage you, you can download the app and watch it for free. <clears throat> you can download the app and cast it to your TV. We only ordered it because it was a little bit grainy, and we want to. We like to see the subtitles too because I was having a hard time. Um, the chosen app um, on your phone, on your computer, watch it with your family. Listen, sometimes okay, we don't feel like reading the Bible this week. We're gonna watch a, uh, an episode a night on the life of Jesus. It's something. It got me thinking. It got me thinking about different pieces. It's an artist's take, but obviously it points to the truth of God's word. So keep moving in that direction. I listen to the Holy Spirit as I read my Bible and pray. Let me point up, uh, put up point number two.
I will offer God a soft heart that is open to correction. Point number one was I will listen to the Holy Spirit as I read my Bible and pray. Of the five points, the second point is I will offer God a soft heart that is open to correction. Of all the things that I could tell you, this might be one of the most important. Any list, if you ever read a list, because there's some, there's some questionable stuff, right? Like, it's hard to take this and go, here's five. That's difficult. But let me just say, if, there's, if you ever hear a list of ways to follow Christ, ways to encourage to grow in your Christian life, and that, and that doesn't mention the heart, in my opinion, then that list is missing the mark. The heart in the Bible is everything. We spent most of 2020 in the book of Matthew. and the book of Matthew, Jesus says a lot of things about the heart. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart has grown dull. Matthew 15, 8. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Without a soft heart, you and I are no better than the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The religious leaders of Jesus' day essentially did this. They did a bunch of good works so that they could essentially put a very bad veil between God and where their heart actually was. And so because of their good works, they would tell God, look at how good I am. And inside, they weren't good. When Jesus comes along, he calls them out on this. If you've read the Gospels at all, you can think of a lot of times when, God, when Jesus says, hey, your, your outside looks good, but your inside's not. Hey, I know you're washing the outside a whole bunch, but you're not washing the inside. One of the most vivid, detailed expressions of this, Jesus says, you are no better than whitewashed tombs. In other words, your tomb, your headstone, your outside, it looks really good. It's nice and white and clean. But inside of that, you're full of dead men's bones. Jesus' point is, God the Father sees you. Listen, it's one thing to lie to one another. We can't lie to God. And so we stand before God and we go, here I am. Look at how good I look on the outside. And God the Father says, but I cared about your heart. So I've met a lot of people like that in my life. Unfortunately or fortunately, I have the job of being a pastor. And um, it's funny, Allison was asking me earlier today, hey, if you could re-choose your job, knowing, knowing everything that you've gone through, would you choose the same job? And I was like, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Half of me feels very blessed, and half of me, it's very, very hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is this. So I used to, when my kids were little, uh, they all played Little League Baseball, and I would always try to coach or man manage or coach or help in any way that I could. And each year, the one question I would avoid, so I would either pretend I would not ask other people, or when asked, I would pretend I didn't hear, or would uh, pretend like I heard something else and answer a different question. I never, ever, ever like telling people what I do for a living. Because as soon as I do that, coaching Little League, and as soon as you say, I'm a pastor, everybody goes, oh, don't say anything to that guy. You gotta be like, hello, Father, how are you this morning? For... I'm like, that's not, it doesn't work that way. I don't like, 
So one season, one season, I successfully made it the whole season. Nobody cared enough to ask me what I do. Praise God, didn't hurt my feelings. And I went through the whole season until the end. At the end banquet, we're all sitting around. And we had done good and everybody was all happy and everything's positive and I'm sitting there eating pizza. And someone says, hey, I never asked you, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor. You would have thought someone broke a bottle in the room or shot a shotgun off, or in a movie, it would be the record needle would grind down the, the record. One guy goes, oh my gosh, I would have never said half the things I said the whole season if I knew you were a pastor. I go, oh, you're just being a guy you're good, like we're good. The other person goes, you gotta be kidding me. I assumed this whole time you were a lawyer. <laughs> That's probably what I should have done, but I didn't. And I hate telling people that I'm a pastor. It ends, it, it, it ends everything. So not only does it end everything that was going good, even worse, it starts a facade. And I hate that. I, I got to tell you, in life, there is nothing worse than a facade. And you guys, have, you guys know people like that. Now, all of a sudden, it's impress the pastor time. And I'm like, I didn't need, I don't, I don't I'm not looking for that. I'm not impressed. And I don't need you to be impressed with me. I, and I just want to be, I just want to live life with you and just love you and just move forward. So out comes the facade. So my lovely wife did the worst thing possible one time. We're shopping for new furniture. And as we're going around, we're looking at blah, blah, blah. And the guy asks us, well, why would you want such a big table? something to that effect. And my wife says, well, my husband's a pastor and we have people over all the time. And I'm like, I am not a pastor. She's a liar. I just like big tables. I don't. And from that moment on, for 10 to 15 minutes, all he said to me was all of the wonderful religious things that he had done over his lifetime. Totally unsolicited. I didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't like, come to me, my child. Uh, I will hear your s s solemn prayers, and I will forgive it, thou of thine sin. I don't, I don't need that. And I'm guessing everybody in this room, you don't need that either. You don't, you don't want a relationship in your life where the person's like performing an act for you and pretending in front of you that they're this, they're this beautiful whitewashed tomb. But as soon as they leave you, they hate you, speak bad about you, condemn you, backstab you, and they're a person that's full of dead men's bones. Nobody likes that. That's what Jesus calls the religious leaders. And, 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 and let me say this. We might have we got a few teens in the room. We'll have some listening online. Let me say this. The absolute biggest lie that America is selling teenagers today is that your primary job is to make your outside look awesome. Buy the right clothes, look the right way, hang around the right people, Spend your money on your outside, your outside, and your outside, and let your inside be a pile of garbage. Biggest lie America sells our teenagers. And they do it, why? So you can find the right person and be complete. You don't need another person to be complete. You need Christ. He will complete you. And then when you begin to be complete in here you will find the right person who cares about your heart. It's an absolute lie 
from the pit of hell. And guess what? A whole bunch of adults believe it too. Outside, outside, outside. I have met some of the some people who are, they're so good on the outside. Just put me to shame in, in every way. And then you start getting to know them, and then you find out. They're actually like dead. They're actually dead inside. They don't even have a heart. They've learned to just hide their heart from God and from others and put a persona out here that impresses everybody. But their heart, according to the Bible, their heart is a piece of rock, and it cannot be moved. This is why this point is so important tonight. I will offer God a soft heart that is open to correction. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart, most famously about the depravity of man in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The DNA of every single person who walks on this planet is that we are selfish, sinful people. We get up in the morning thinking about ourselves. We think about ourselves during the day. We think about ourselves when we go to sleep, and we dream about ourselves. But the Bible promises something more. Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, this is an Old Testament passage speaking about a New Testament concept. When you repent of your sin and you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you and gives you a new heart. He fills you and gives you this soft heart. Now, you're in charge of this soft heart. In other words, the Bible talks about keeping a soft heart towards God, not choosing to harden your heart against God, not choosing to grieve the Holy Spirit who indwells your heart. So the Bible tells us about our heart. The world also tells us about our heart. The world says, trust your heart. The world says, listen to your heart. The world says that children are born innocent and pure and we mess them up. We do mess them up. That's a true statement. But they're not born innocent and pure. They're born selfish little sinners who want to take the toys of others and then beat up those children. I am amazed at how people have children, observe them in their natural habitat, and then produce theological systems that say, no, they're all gold. Looks like they treat each other with love and respect. Must be us who messes them up. The Bible's clear that we're all sinners. We're born into a sinful world. That's our DNA. It's what we do. But here's the question. Who do you believe? Because now we live in a world full of fake news. Can I just say this, please? Anything you hear on social media needs to be fact-checked somewhere. Please. Stop forwarding fake news. Stop believing fake news. But the world's theological systems are fake news. They really are. Because they are in polar opposite to this. So who are we going to believe? Going back to last week's sermon, this is why it's important that you're in the Word of God. You were born with old software. You just were. It wasn't your fault. It was Adam and Eve's fault. If Adam and Eve didn't sin, you would have. So you have bad software. It's outdated. And God's Word will update your software. But you have to be in it. You have to, you have to go into life saying, 
I am not to be trusted. I am a sinner. I have been graciously saved by Jesus. I am indwelt by his Holy Spirit. And the Father loves me. But guess what? I still have flesh at some level. And I can use that flesh in evil ways. I really can. So I don't, I don't want to trust my instinct. I don't want to trust how I feel in a moment. I don't want to trust myself when I'm mad. I need to go to God's word. And I need to continue to download this every single day because my old fleshly software doesn't work all the time. This will help me. We offer God a soft heart. That's a new heart created by him, filled with the Holy Spirit. We are then honest before God with that heart. We simply say, God, I'm a, I'm a human. I'm a regular person. I have temptation. I have ways of sin. I have things that are bad habits. I have ways that I hurt others and hurt myself. God, I just want to be honest about that with you. That's keeping a soft heart before God. And now, I also have to be open to correction. I've met too many people over the years where I might earn some level of trust with them and then I need to meet and then we were talking and we're talking and we're, it turns into maybe a counseling session and they ask my opinion and, and at that moment, I get to say, hey, um, you are wrong about that. By the way, if you want to be popular, don't do that. If you want to be popular as a teenager, don't stand up for anything that's ever right. Just be a malleable pile of garbage that goes along with whatever drifting of the sea is in high school and junior high. You'll be a lot more popular. But if you want to be unpopular in this world, at some point you have to lovingly come to someone and say, hey, I, I love you, but that's not right. And then at that point, you're, you're super not popular. And I get to do that sometimes. And um, I try to say it graciously. And most often, Christians, people who really love Jesus, really want to do what's right, uh, trust me and trust that I'm saying in a loving way, tell me to go pound sand. That's somebody who, who says they love Jesus. I'm not even talking about the people who I've met with who are like, don't love Jesus, are making radically bad decisions, and I'm basically like one last stop sign for the love of God, I'm begging you, don't do that. You'll destroy yourself and your family. I'm, I'm begging you, don't do that. We can find other ways. When I come to this point, it sounds easy. I will offer a, God a soft heart that is open to correction. But what I have found as a pastor over 20 years of ministry is that most people believe that the person who cor can correct them is who? God alone. And somehow, magically, I don't know how this is, God always agrees with them. So they never actually have to face correction because only God can correct them and only God can correct me and God happens to never really disagree with what I happen to be doing. Fascinating how that happens. By the way, if the God you serve only ever agrees with you, then you're only serving yourself. You're not serving the God of the Bible. That, it couldn't be true. I don't know how we could write a math problem. My wife is like a gifted mathematician. She could probably write a math problem somewhere that would prove that. I don't even know. But there's no way it could be true. You would have to be God. At some point, I would have to admit, I'm going to be walking along, and I'm going to walk the wrong way. And at that point, God would need to correct me. 
But when I say the word, I'm open to correction, I don't mean, I don't mean from this. Because here's what us selfish sinners are really good at. Reading the New Testament, reading the New Testament. Well, wow, there's a verse that does not sound good to me. Skip to the book of John. I've, I have literally skipped passages. Or I'll tell you the most famous one I ever skipped was uh, 1 Timothy with the, uh, with the uh, characteristic elders. And TJ, Jeremy were at least there when we did this study. I was so, there's a list of qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy. And there's a few of them that can be highly debated. And so I love to debate those. You know I've read that passage, I, I kid you not, hundreds of times, that one passage, hundreds. And someone finally pointed out to me that one of the characteristics of an elder is that he is hospitable. You know, I, I read the word. I, ne I never, it never even occurred to me. Never even occurred. I read, I read straight over it to get to the part that I really wanted to hammer home. It's right there. I've, I've literally read it. So when I say that you're open to correction, I do mean this. Yes, you read the Bible and you go, I'm, I, I need to be correct. That corrects me. Yes. Praying to God and God through his Holy Spirit impresses on you. You're wrong in this. Absolutely. But I also want a name. You don't need to say it out loud, but I really need every person in this room, if you're going to accomplish this next, this next one, I need a name in your head. And I mean a name where you, and I've got one, two, three. I have two or three in my head. I mean a name like this. This person comes to you. They love you so much and your relationship is so solid with them that they say, I, I, I've seen something in your life, I need to talk to you. And you go, wow, okay, you, if you, you love me so much, if you've seen this in me, then I need to listen to you. And you know they're so biblically based that they wouldn't just make something up. They don't want to beat you up. They're not trying to ruin your life. They just love you so much. They want to talk to you about God's word in your life. And then they bring it up. This happened to me in the last year and a half. They bring it up. And when the person brought it up, I thought, nah. <laughs> and I could make the argument that I was half right and he was half right. I could make the argument 50-50. And, and, and actually pull myself out of it and make the argument both ways. But the man is so godly. And he loved me so much. And he could see a nuance. Remember, we've talked about this often, that if I'm staring down the pipe here, and I got this right here, and I'm looking at you guys, and I'm like, life is awesome. I've got no fingers right next to my head. And you say, straight up, there's a finger next to your head. And I'm like, mm-mm, nope, because I'm looking this way. They can see the finger, and you can't. But he loved me so much, and I trusted him so much and there was a finger, and he pointed out, and I just said, okay. No debating, no arguing. I'm not happy. Please don't get me wrong. None of this is happy. It's terrible. It's terrible in life for someone to come to you and say, I love you, you're messing up. It hurts. It puts strain on the relationship, and it's hard. So I'm not, this isn't super happy time. It's not like I'm sitting down, he's sitting down, and he goes, hey, dude, I think you're wrong about um, um, the, the uh, windshield wipers you chose in your truck. And I was like, really? Interesting. Do you have some better windshield wipers? Oh, yeah, there's actually uh, there's a better brand out there. All right, cool. We're not talking about that. We're talking about 
I observe something in your life that you do, and a bunch of us don't like it. <laughs> and that feels awesome. But I love him, I love him so much. He's such a godly man. And he loves me. And I said, okay. I'll submit. And I'm going to take that piece and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on it as hard as I can. You all have, you have to. You have to have somebody like that. Because I'm telling you, it's in here. What you're, it's in here. If we were all self-aware, we would, we would read it on our own and go, oh my, I'm, I'm a very self-aware person, and it's right there, and it's clear that I'm doing this to others, and I'm so self-aware. I rebuked myself, and nobody needs to talk to me. Uh, that rarely happens. By the way, nobody ever changes either. I say that. If you see someone changing, even a little, you should praise them. Over the top, praise them. I mean the smallest change. We don't like change. We push changes. We do everything so we don't have to change people. We literally surround ourselves with people who are like us so we don't have to change. If you see someone changing, praise them. But I want a name in your head. And if you don't have a name, one of your jobs for the rest of this year is to start developing a name. Who can rebuke you? Who will you listen to? Who could come to you in a loving way and say, you need to change? And you wouldn't argue, you would listen, you would trust them, and you would move forward and you would work on it. We've already committed to listening to the Holy Spirit as we read our Bibles and pray. Now we're committing to offering God a soft heart that is open to correction. So I want you three things this week. One, be honest with God. Be honest about where you're at and don't lie to God. If you lie to God, he's kind of smart and sort of knows stuff, and you can't fool him. Not like Santa Claus, who you can fool. He's God. You've got to be honest with him. Two, stop believing the fake news that you should listen to your own heart. You shouldn't. You are desperately wicked, just like me. You've got to go to God's word and get an upgrade. And three, you need someone in your life. You trust them so much that if they correct you, you will absolutely listen to them. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for each person who's here. Father, I love them. Most importantly, you love them. But we, we want to work on this, Father. We want to have soft hearts towards you that are open to correction and that means we actually have believers in our life, Father. Please, help us with this spiritual discipline as we begin to open more and more doors in our relationship with you, and we close those doors that Satan wants to open in our life. It's in Christ's name that we pray.